welcome to Communion Bible Church. If you look, you'll see things coming up in, uh, uh, here in, uh, this, this Sunday and also in, in the Sundays ahead of us. Donna, I mean, uh, Charlotte, Charlotte, you have an announcement for the potluck. Yes, we have potluck today, and if you are not planning on staying, you are more than welcome to stay anyway, and I don't think anybody will go away hungry. <laughs> you do it because you decided not to eat anything. Wes has volunteered to give up his portion. <laughs> I wouldn't say that, but, not maybe, not maybe. <laughs> but maybe you will. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's right. You'll look also the children's uh, bell choir will perform next Sunday, not the 19th, but the 12th. So please put that on your calendar. That's next Sunday, not December the 19th, not two Sundays from now. Any other announcements? I got one here. Uh, men, we are going to do a men's outing a week from today. It's going to be a classic Western movie afternoon. We're going to watch an old Western with John Wayne from 1956 called The Searchers. And it's going to be at the Nichols Theater in uh, Frogtown, Georgia. <laughs> and, uh, I'm in Frogtown. <laughs> Roger, you want to say anything about the uh, movie day? Uh, I'll have drinks and popcorn and soda or whatever. Right. <laughs> and uh, if you've never been to Roger's house to watch a movie, it's really cool. He he, he got a vision from the Lord years ago to turn his horizons <laughs> into a movie theater. It's just wonderful. I just so. need to keep him out of the house. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank all the men so far that are supporting the men's group. Thank you so much for really having a good time. Please come next week. Bring a friend if you'd like to. But just let us know if you're going to bring a friend so we can make sure we got plenty of popcorn and everything. Yes, what sir. time is it? Oh, 2 o'clock. 2 o'clock, a week from today. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Gary. Yes. Uh, this month, of course, we are looking for anybody who wants to sing a Christmas song. Some of you have special songs or whatever. If you would like to do something, please come and talk to me, and we'll see how we can work it into our Christmas our Christmas One Juanita, you have, you have an announcement. I know it's the second time around, but I have to bear with me. <laughs> In case you weren't here uh, last week, uh, December 18th, we have an open house at our house, uh, soup, soup open house. And we'd love for you all to come. And I've already started making the, the soups now, so there'll be plenty. Just a call, and there's a... An invitation out there on the table that you can take, and then it has our address on it, where to get, and how to RSVP, and tell us how many are coming. And you can bring a friend. You can bring more than a friend. Just tell me how many are coming, so I have enough pots. Awesome. Got it? <laughs> Paul Jones has frequented a lot of soup kitchens. <laughs> <laughs> and he is he is an expert in soup, so he may come and, and you know, taste yours. But he is frequent in a lot of soup kitchens. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard friends to come to the soup kitchen with me, and they're no, no gates. <laughs> <laughs> Mandy. Uh, our family had a birthday last week, and we have one today. Ella and Levi. Both of you have birthdays today. Well, right. Levi's is today. Ella's was last Sunday. Uh, happy birthday to you. Any other announcements? As we begin, oh, excuse me. Yeah. I'm sorry. And also instruments. If you're an instrument you want to play the Christmas song, just please come talk to me. All right. All right. Yes, Ritzy. I'm thankful that on Tuesday we'll celebrate our 30th anniversary. 30th anniversary. Awesome. That's great. That wasn't my one. I was waiting for you to say something, but I could tell you weren't going to say it. Celebrating the Lord's Supper, 
So as we do that, uh, as we pass out, please uh, prepare your heart for that. We'll be singing the two courses of a song. Then we'll have the uh, communion. And then we'll we'll finish off with a, a song at the very end. So me and you will come to, to serve.
can. Y'all do better. Than that. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Very good. Start with that. All right. <clears throat>
people is that we are very, very impatient people. Yeah, amen. Can I get an amen? We are. I mean, how many times have you been in a traffic light, and as soon as the light turns green, the guy behind you honks? Okay? I mean, it's uncanny. If you don't take your foot off that brake pedal right away, boy, they're right there with that horn. You know, we like microwave ovens. We like express lines. I was reminded this week of how much we hate to wait. We hate to wait. All of us do. This last Monday, I had to go in for lab work because I have a doctor's appointment tomorrow. Now, I've been to this lab before, and I've just walked in, signed in, and have had to wait. This time, I actually made a reservation, and they sent me this, uh, this email, or this uh, text message, thank you, text message, thank you young lady, good to hear from the high school section over here, <laughs> anyway, and uh, it was so great because it said, arrive 15 minutes early, you can sit in your car, you can Whatever you want to do, just let us know when you arrive, and we will send you a text message to let you know we're ready for you. <laughs> now, the last time I went, I sat for a long time. So I thought, okay, this will be good. I'll try this. So I did try it. And so I was there 15 minutes early. I said, I'm here, ready. When you're ready for me, I waited in the car for about 15 minutes. My appointment was at 1130. I thought, okay, I'll go ahead and walk into the lobby in the medical building and I'll sit out there so I'm even closer <laughs> and I did and sure enough I got the text and I walked in that door and it was so crowded kind of like this picture up here it was so crowded that there were people standing and I thought I just walked right up to the counter and I said I got your text message I'm here well, thank you, Mr. Chaplain. You can walk right through this door and go to the first room on the left. To which everybody probably thought, <laughs> Who is this guy? <laughs> well, I'm the teaching pastor. <laughs> As a matter of fact, that's who I am. And I just walked right through that door to everybody's surprise because I wasn't waiting like they were. I sat down in this little room waiting for one of the first, uh, three technicians to come and say, come on back here and we'll uh, poke you. And another lady came in. Oh, and she was hot. She was hot. She'd been waiting for over an hour. So I engaged her in conversation and I said, you know, today for this appointment, I actually uh, signed up online ahead of time and I only had to wait about 15 minutes. And she said, I'm going to remember that because i got to come back here for routine blood work. And she was glad about that. But all those other people were waiting because they went in and signed in like everybody else and had to wait their turn, whereas I had already planned to do that. That was Monday. On Tuesday, Susan and I went on a date. <laughs> and we went out to lunch. And then we were going to go hit a couple stores. First store she wanted to hit was Ross. <laughs> I don't like Ross. Marshall's is okay. TJ Maxx is okay. I don't like Ross. I rarely find any deals in there that I like. And it's usually crappy. So we went in. I looked at the checkout lines. They only had three cashiers. And there was a, there was a line already, which I expected. So Susan and I split up. I went one direction. She went another. And we looked around. Nothing grabbed me. Well, I did find a package of, of T-shirts, okay, and which I could have got at Sam's for probably the same price. So. But I put them in my basket, and uh, I met her in the back, in the houseware section. And when I got back there, there was a little bit of a line. I thought, well, gosh, that's where the dressings or rooms were. And I thought, oh, I guess these people are waiting to try on clothing. There must be a long line to get in there. Or maybe they're checking some people out in the back. What I didn't realize was that was the end of the line from the front of the store. <laughs> that line went, the checkout lines 
were right in the middle of the store. The lines went all the way to the side, all the way down the side, around the back, a third of the way across the store. And there were people with one or two items in a basket. And I thought, they're going to be standing there for 45 minutes. I thought, there is no deal that that's that good. <laughs> that I am good. Susan had picked up a teacup, and then she thought, yeah, I don't really need another teacup. <laughs> if you've been to our house, you know she did not need another teacup. She loves teacups and teapots and all of that. So, we walked out. Happy as a player. Because we had saved them a lot of money that day. <laughs> and I said, I don't need those t-shirts that bad. We hate to wait. And the thing that we really hate to wait on is justice. Mm -hmm. we, we, just, we, don't want, we are so conditioned to watch a television program that's 30 to 60 minutes long and the bad guy gets it in the end. Or we go to a movie. Well, we don't go to movies anymore, do we? We, we watch a movie, and the, you know, justice wins out in the end. We feel good. Everything's great. But you know, as well as I do, that's not the way things work out. That's what this series is all about. Here is Habakkuk, who is frustrated with evil that's going on in his own country. Can I get an amen? Anybody relate to that? And so what happens is he goes to God and he complains about it. And believe it or not, God does not zap him with a lightning bolt. He says, I went to, I've come to you repeatedly and it's like you're not listening. And God still does not zap him with a lightning bolt. And so we have been learning lessons as we've been going through this series. The first lesson was we need to express our struggles about God's ways to him. Don't keep it all bottled up. Don't just complain to your friends and family. Go to God directly. He knows you're frustrated. Just go ahead and open up and talk to him about it. Tell him how you feel. He is willing to listen to our complaints. So that was the first thing that we learned from what Habakkuk did. In the second part, we saw that but when you go to God in prayer, you better be ready for whatever answer He gives you. Because we kind of go to, to prayer and expect a certain uh, response. And it may be something so totally different than what we want that we're not going to like it. And that's exactly what Habakkuk got from God. God, you're not doing anything about this evil. To which he responds, oh, I've been doing something. In fact, I've been doing something that's going to blow your socks off when you find out about it. You're not going to believe it. He says, in essence, I have been moving chess pieces across the global board to put things in place to deal with the problem that you've raised. I am putting down the Assyrians and I'm raising up the Babylonians. Both secular nations, by the way, and they are going to be on my rod of discipline against my people. Well, that creates another problem. And that is that God uses our enemies to reprove us, his own people. His goal for us is that we would be holy as he would be holy. That we would reflect his glory. That we would, would give him honor and people would see us in the relationship we have and would want to follow after God. And that's what God's people have always been intended to be able to do. And so we, we saw in Hebrews that God is going to discipline us as children, as a father does to his children, to make us holy. He's going to do that. Now today what we're going to see is that we, by faith, must accept God's methods and timeline in accomplishing justice. Because what he's going to tell Habakkuk in this section is, hey, even though you've complained to me about the fact that how can a more evil nation be used 
to discipline your very own people, he says, oh, but that rod of discipline that I'm going to use against my people, I am going to break that rod of discipline. I'm going to hold them accountable for the evil that they commit. And so, justice is coming. And he says it's coming quickly. Now that's one of the things we're going to have to explore. How quick is quickly? Is our idea of quick the same thing as God's idea of quick? Uh, no, it's not. No, it's not. Preview of coming attractions. All right. So justice will be coming on the Babylonians. They will be punished for crimes against humanity, not just to Judah, but also to the other victimized nations that fall under their influence. They will be held accountable. And he spends a lot of time in this next section talking about that. Now, all of us want hope. All of us are looking for hope. When we are sick, when we get bad news, we all want hope. In fact, it says in Proverbs 13, 12, hope deferred makes the heart sick. Is that not true? Have there not been times in your life where you have been hopeless? You look at a situation and you say, I don't see any way out of this. I don't see any hope in this whatsoever. But a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. That's what we want. We're looking for that. We want hope. And believe it or not, there is hope in this passage today. There is hope for helping us to deal with the struggles that we have with the evil that's happening in this country, in Europe, in Australia, in everywhere where evil is manifesting itself, there's a way that we can get through that. And that word is faith. The just will live by faith. That's what makes us different. We can hold on to hope by having faith in God. Now last week we saw that we need to lean in on the character of God. It is certain, it is sure, it is our stability in rocky times. We can have hope because of who God is. But it's going to require faith. Walking by faith because what we see is not good. But we know what God has done in the past. And we know what he's going to do in the future. So we hold on to that. And that's what's going to get us through it. So you're going to walk out of here today, I believe, with more hope about the evil that you and I are seeing going on all around us. If we will remember that God is in control, God is going to hold accountable those who are evil for what they're doing and persecuting others. Not just God's people, but even other secular nations. Long section today, so let me read it to you, okay? Three screens, that's how much it takes up today. Here's how it goes. And the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so that he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end, it will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it, it will surely come. It will not delay. Now he starts getting into the Babylonians. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. Moreover, wine is a traitor, an arrogant man who is never at rest. His greed is as wide as Sheol. Like death, he has never enough. He gathers for himself all nations and collects them as his own peoples. Shall not all these take up their taunt against him with scoffing and riddles for him and say, Woe to him who heaps up what is not his own. For how long? And loads himself with pledges. Will not your debtors suddenly arise and those awake who will make you tremble? then you will be spoiled for them because you have plundered many nations. All the remnant of the people shall plunder you for the blood of man and violence to the earth 
to cities and all who dwell in them. Woe to him who gets evil gain for his house, to set his nest on high, to be safe from the reach of harm. You have devised shame for your house by cutting off many peoples, and you have forfeited your life. For the stone will cry out from the wall, and the beam from the woodwork respond. Woe to him who builds a house with blood and founds a city on iniquity. Behold, it is not, behold, it is not from the Lord of hosts that peoples labor merely for fire, and nations weary themselves for nothing. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Amen. Amen. Woe to him who makes his neighbors drink. And you pour out your wrath and make them drunk in order to gaze at their nakedness. You will have your fill of shame instead of glory. Drink your shut selves and show your uncircumcision. The cup is the Lord, in the Lord's right hand will come upon around to you, and utter shame will come upon your glory. The violence done to Lebanon will overwhelm you, as will the destruction of the beasts that terrify them. For the blood of man and violence to the earth, to cities, and all who dwell in them. What profit is an idol when its maker is shaped? A metal image, a teacher of lies. Woe to him who says to a wooden thing, Awake to a silent stone. Arise! Can this teach? Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all in it. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Amen and amen. So what we have here are oracles of woe against the evil Babylonians. Oracles of woe are declarations of wrongdoing and then a pronouncement of resulting impending judgment. The prophecy against the Babylonians consists of woe oracles divided into two parts, verses 6 to 14 and then 15 to 20, both of which end with, a, with summary statements declaring the glory and greatness of God. Now, in verses 6 to 8, he gives kind of a general assessment. He deals with the Babylonians' greed, violence, and bloodshed in their conquests. Then he goes on to talk about relying on wealth and treasures and excessive fortification for their protection. And in verse 10 in particular, for killing many people. In 12 to 14, he talks about building their town with violence and injustice. And then he ends with his statement about God's glory. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Then, in the next section, 15 to 17, for inflicting open shame and embarrassment on peoples. For the destruction of beasts, people, and the earth. In 18 to 20, for their idolatrous worship of handcrafted gods. But the Lord, by contrast, but the Lord is in His holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before Him. So these oracles of woe are proclaimed upon the Babylonians for what's going to occur. So justice will come to the Babylonians. And this is something that we could be sure of was going to happen, and indeed it did. So the focal point of this passage is really on the eventual justice regarding crimes against humanity. Not just against Judah, but against other nations of the earth as well. Now with that phrase, crimes against humanity, we've heard that before, haven't we? I mean, you've heard of the Nuremberg Trials, right? Post-World War II, Nazi Germany. And there are people today that are proposing that there need to be Nuremberg-style trials for those that are committing crimes against humanity. I'll get into that in just a moment. But as we look at this, beginning in verse 3, we see justice comes on God's timetable. 
for the Babylonians. Now, one commentator I looked at said probably 47 years after Judah's punishment began. 47 years. Can you think where you were 47 years ago? For, think about that. 47 years. They had to wait. They had to have faith that this was going to occur. In verses 4 and 5, it will fall on Babylonians, on Babylon for its proud, unrighteous, greedy attacks on all nations who fall prey to them. They are gloating. They're so powerful. They're so mighty. They think they're indestructible. The destruction will come upon them. In verses 7 to 8, the remnant of those persecuted nations will return and plunder guilty Babylon. Do you remember when God's people were in Egypt and they cried out to God? They were enslaved and they prayed for deliverance and God sent them a deliverer. Who was that deliverer? Moses was. And do you remember what happened when Egypt finally let them go? They plundered Egypt when they left. Those curses were so severe that they said, take our gold, our silver, just Get out! We can't take it anymore. And they actually plundered those who had persecuted them. In verses 15 to 17, Babylon will be shamed as they have openly shamed other nations. This is God's way of doing things. But it doesn't always happen on our timetable. And that's what we have to keep in mind. That's what we have to accept we can't change it. We may as well accept it and choose to live by faith. Now this brings us to some ponder points. The first ponder point is this. Will God hold accountable those committing crimes against humanity in modern times? Well, what would lead us to think that he would do any differently <coughs> in this period of history than what he's done before? You see, here's what we do. We, we look at biblical history, and then we look at modern secular history. And we forget that all history is His story. Whether it's in the pages of Scripture or not, it's all His history. And it is all coming to the conclusion that He has for it. He is going to move those chess pieces on the board to bring His will into completion. In his time, he knows exactly what he's doing. He lives, as Rick reminded us last week, God lives outside of time. We are bound by time. God is not. He sees the beginning from the end. And he's bringing history to the conclusion that he has for it. And he's waiting to do what he's going to do in his time. So does our natural secular worldview lead us to doubt that God operates today as he did in biblical history. You say, wait a minute, Andy. Wait a minute. Natural, secular worldview? That doesn't describe me. Oh, really? I would venture to say that most of us have grown up in public schools where we were told this is history. It was taught from a secular viewpoint. God was not a part of that. And we were taught this is history. And we in Western civilizations are very scientific in our approach to everything versus Eastern nations, which are much more uh, spiritual in their perspective. We forget this is a spiritual world we're living in. There are, there are angels and demons and powers and principalities at work. Read the book of Daniel and you'll see examples of that. There is stuff going on behind the curtain that we just don't know about. But we're to keep this in our mind. God is moving history where he's going to move it. And Satan is trying to counter those moves. But he will never win. He will use the evil in people to control certain events. And God allows what he wants to allow to occur. He is sovereign even over Satan's failed strategies. Will they be punished on both sides of eternity? We're talking about Babylon is going to be punished on 
this side of eternity. We know that the guilty are going to be held accountable in eternity, don't we? We all know that. We accept that. But we're talking about how they're going to be held accountable beforehand. And that's what's taking place. A good example of this is King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, may I remind you, who stands out on his veranda and says, look what I've created. And God says, oh, big boy. And he even knew that this was coming. He was warned that this was going to happen. Daniel told him because he had, because Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and Daniel interpreted He says, this is what's going to happen. And sure enough, it happened. And he lost his sanity. He became like a beast of the field until he looked up, his sanity returned to him, and he proclaimed the God, God is the sovereign ruler of the universe. This is a secular king. He's worked in this man's life. And he gives this wonderful adoration on who God is and on his sovereignty. So it can happen on both sides. Can it? Who are those in modern times that are guilty of crimes against humanity? We, we look at, at distant history, modern history, and we think about Germany regarding World War I, World War II, the Third Reich, and, and their crimes against the Jews, the gypsies, the mentally disabled. That's the reason for the Nuremberg trial. And we see the evil that they perpetrated on people. It was just out and out evil. And the nations of the world held them accountable for that. When we look at recent history, nations persecuting God's people and other nations, let's look at this. Open Doors is a ministry to the persecuted church around the world. This is Brother Andrew's organization. Let your eyes scan that list a little bit. These nations are ranked in terms of the extent of their persecution against God's people. They rank them from 1 to 50. I didn't have room for all of it. So I went through 17 because it included China. It's listed by ranking, by country, by the type of persecution that they are perpetrating the region of the world in which that country dwells and their main religious background. Let your eyes look down that list of main religious background. Does anything jump out against you? That jump out at you? Look at how many of them are Islamic. This is what's going on in the world. I look at number nine, Nigeria. Susan and I have friends from Nigeria. Now, they're from southern Nigeria, which is the Christianized portion of that nation. This is an African nation. But in northern Nigeria, you've heard of Boko Haram and the persecution that takes place against Christians. Horrific persecution. I mean, slaughtering Christians, um, trafficking women, Christian women and making them uh, brides and raping them. And, I mean, it's, it's horrible. It's horrific, the kinds of things that happen in these nations. And this is what's going on right now with people around the world. I've given you the link on the handout if you want to go to this site. And you can read there very specifically about the persecution in these countries. But this is what we're looking at. God's people have always been persecuted. And our brethren around the world are facing intense persecution. And we're seeing a rising of evil in this nation. And we're wondering, Susan and I were talking about this on the way over here today. And I said, you know what? It may come to a point. We don't know where... We may find ourselves in the same situation that Germany finds itself in, or Australia. 
under the guise of health, where the government's going to say, oh, this church and other churches can't meet. You cannot meet in an open environment like this. If that happens, what are we going to do? Are we going to be able to meet in micro churches, in homes? What are we going to do to practice our faith? It may come to that. And the pastors that I am developing, we've actually talked about this. If this were to occur, we should be doing this anyway. We should be developing small group communities anyhow. But if this were to happen, how ready would you be for your church to meet in smaller groups for fellowship and teaching and worship and support of one another? This could happen. And what about individuals committing crimes against humanity? I mean, names come up that are that are we've been banting about for years. Adolf Hitler. Joseph, Dr. Joseph Mengele, right? And uh, Idi Amin, Pol Pot, with his, the persecution of his own Cambodian people in Ramar Rouge. I mean, just evil, evil. That is just, it's, it's demonic, it's satanic, evil. It, it's an evil that, it, it must be even greater than our own sin nature. These things have gone on. And there are names that pop up today all the time that, that we have heard that we're wondering what's going on right now. What about these individuals? What about the, the George Soros and Klaus Schwab in, in what they're doing with uh, population control and by economic controls? What about Bill Gates and, and what about Anthony Fauci and what's going on with the biological uh, attack that's happening around the world? You know, what, what in the world is going on with, with Jeffrey Epstein and, and Ghislaine Maxwell in human sex trafficking? That trial of, of Ghislaine Maxwell is going on right now. I mean, evil, just evil that's going on. What about, what about the Clintons and what they've gotten away with? I mean, I, I, I'm not trying to make this political, but these are names that come up in the news where we go, how can these people continue to get away with things like this? I want you to know God holds these people accountable. Judgment will come upon those who commit crimes against humanity. It's going to occur. Now, I'm thinking of one particular horrific persecutor of the church. His name was Saul. Remember Saul? Public enemy number one in the Christian community. But God, in His grace, reached out drew him to himself. Imagine that you had family members who were put to death because of Saul's persecution. And you hear that this guy is now claiming to be a follower of Jesus? Think of the skepticism. How would you like to be Barnabas and introduce him to the body of Christ? <laughs> oh, <laughs> That's not the kind of PR job I'd like to have to perform. I mean, can you imagine the skepticism? And, and yet Paul had a genuine conversion. And I believe Paul felt guilty the rest of his life for what he had done to God's people. I really believe it haunted him. And that's what God did for us. Oh, we weren't war criminals. But we were criminals against God's will. Every one of us. And God reached out in His grace and pulled us in. We didn't deserve it. It wasn't because of any inherent goodness within us that God said, Oh, that's a good enough person. I'm going to reach in and grab them and adopt them into my family. 
Oh, but for the grace of God, that would be our destiny as well. But God spared us. Will God really bless and curse nations based on their blessing or cursing of Israel? Genesis 12, 3 says, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who, who I will curse, and all the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. He that promised to Abraham, and it was to succeed all through the Jewish race. Well, let's just look at historically what has happened with nations that have cursed Israel. The Assyrian Empire went down. Babylonians went down. Greece, Romans, Ottomans, Nazi Germany, Imperial Japan, even Arab nations that are constantly at war with each other who have cursed Israel. Look what's happened to them. And what about the United States? We have chosen as a nation to bless Israel. There are Christian historians that theorize that the only reason that America has been blessed is because of that. Not because of our goodness, but because we have chosen to bless Israel, to provide safe haven for them. And that may be. And what happens when an administration turns its back? on Israel. You know, I read a report this week, um, Amir Safari, Safari, am I saying that right? Captain? Okay. Just saw a video. He's reporting from Israel. He is a, uh, a completed Jew. And he said, the Minister of Defense in Israel has just announced, we are preparing to go to war with Iran. Woo! Gee, just a nice little secular affair, right? Is this prophesied in Ezekiel? Oh, yes. And what's going to happen in the rest of the world when that kicks up? Friends, we can be seeing the fulfillment of biblical prophecy happening right before our eyes. And I don't believe the United States is going to come to the end of Israel. No one's going to come to the end of Israel except God. And He's going to receive glory. It's unfolding the way God said it was going to unfold. Here's another potter point. How long must we wait for God's justice to finally fall on the guilty? How long? What is the most accurate measure of swift judgment and punishment? Do you know? I don't. I don't think my measurement standard is accurate because God's view is very different. When he says something swift and it takes 47 years, I wouldn't call that swift. Not me, the guy who doesn't like to stand in line with Ross. <laughs> oh no, that's not swift. And you know the scripture that says a thousand years in your sight, O oh Lord, are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. God does not measure time the way we do. So what are we left with? We're left with waiting. How do we do that? How do we have hope when our non-Christian conservative neighbors become hopeless because we trust in God. And we've seen what God has done in the past. We know what His character is and we know He's trustworthy. And so we choose as an act of our will to trust in Him, to have faith in Him. The just shall live by Faith. That's the lesson we have to we have to hold on to. So, as you and I personally struggle with the justice of God, remember He will punish all people and nations, mistreating other people and nations who are guilty of crimes against humanity. As we personally struggle with the justice of God, distinguish yourself as righteous as you walk by your faith in Him. As you and I personally struggle with the justice of God, bear in mind that God's timing allowed us the opportunity to turn from our own sin and place our trust in Him. Remember that justice will come in the time He knows perfectly well should occur. 
And as you and I personally struggle with the justice of God, except that our enemies may gloat over us in the short term, but God will eventually punish them, eventually, for the evil they perpetrate against you and I. It's going to occur. We just have to wait for it. And we don't like that. Now I'm going to ask us to do something today. A little different. You saw the board up here, right? You're thinking, what in the world is this board up here? Kevin, was it Kevin? Kevin, what did you ask me? Or you guys? The Ross Perot board. Yeah, Ross Perot board. <laughs> and I'm going to write a word in the middle of this board. And I want you to come up with as many synonyms for this word that you can. And let's make sure. Oh, good, good, and black. I hope that even shows up on the camera over there. The word is trust. Someone give me a synonym for trust. Rely. Rely. Confidence. Confidence. Rest. Rest. Did somebody say rest? Okay. Commitment. Commitment. Now, how do you mean that, Ed? How do you, you mean? have a trust? It doesn't become activated until you commit something okay. to the trust. Did you say commitment or commit? Either one will work. Okay. Either one will work. Okay. Faith. 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 Okay. I thought you said hate. I thought, what? I'm not hearing that right. I'm not hearing that right. Right hand right hand. <laughs> okay. I used to be a teacher. I had to write on board the line. <laughs> secure. Secure. Okay. Is secure or how about security? Responsibility. You think of the others? How about dependence? Hope. Hope. <clears throat> allegiance. Allegiance. Because if you trust somebody, you pledge your allegiance to them. You you believe them. Allege, I'm not spelling this right. I A N C E. Say again. That's what I thought, but it just didn't look right in my head. Okay. Yeah, that is right. You're right where you go. It doesn't look right. Okay. Now, assurance. Okay. All right. So, now the reason I ask you to do this. Last January 1st, I asked the Lord to give me a word for the year. And that word was trust. And so, I don't know why, but that was the word that just came to me. It's like the Lord said, trust. And I thought, okay, trust. So I put together a word splash like that. Like this. And this is magnetic. And this sticks right there on our refrigerator. And when I come down the stairs in the morning, I see that right there on the refrigerator. Because this helps me to remember I have to live my life this way. Now, I didn't know what this year was going to look like. I had a clue because I knew some things in the news that, it, that were troubling. All right. But I had no idea what was going to happen to my health. I had no idea what was going to happen in our family. I didn't know about Susan's eye problems that she's experienced. But God did. And this is the word he gave me. 
And when we think of these synonyms, synonyms have a way of helping you to kind of look at something from different perspectives. This is what we need to do as we are struggling with what we see going on around us that's evil. We have to choose to trust in the Lord, that He is sovereign, that He's in control, that He is shaping history and bringing it to the conclusion that He has for it. And that's hard. That means we cannot always walk by sight. We have to choose, as an act of our will, to walk by faith. And that's not easy. But then the Christian life is not always easy, is it? The life of faith is not always easy. But this is what we're left with. Judgment is coming. Do you agree with that? Amen. It's coming. We don't know when it's coming, but it's coming. And we don't know how it's going to come. We don't have a prophet today who said, I'm speaking on behalf of the Lord. We have those who say they're doing that, but I don't believe that a lot of what we see going on is really legit. But we don't have anybody that can speak with the forcefulness of a true prophet of God and say, thus says the Lord. We don't know. So we have to choose to walk by faith. Even if we had a prophet telling us that, we'd still have to choose to walk by faith. Because we didn't know, wouldn't know when it's going to occur. This should give us hope, friends. Because we're going to continue to see an outpouring of evil as we get closer to the time of Christ's return. But encourage one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. Hebrews 10, 25. Which means we need to be together. We need to talk words of faith and encouragement and support to one another. That God will be there. Even in what appears to be the silence. He's there. We've seen Him work in the past. Historically in the world, we've seen Him in our own lives do things. But we have to choose to trust. That's our responsibility. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the encouragement that we get from this portion of your word. We know it's not easy, but we know that you are faithful and you're loving and you, and you will bring your story to its conclusion. And we know the end of the story. We just don't know when. Thank you that we even know the end of the story because it's in your word. Thank you for the hope that you instill within us. Thank you that we can rise above the evil that surrounds us when we have faith in you. We confess it. We confess that we have it. But help our unbelief. Help our unbelief. <clears throat> We pray these things for your glory. Amen. Amen. All right. <laughs> Always want to be available.
justice in his time. Uh, go in peace, and don't forget, potluck today. Please stay with us. Thank you. You're dismissed. Thank you.